again, so grateful for you guys to all join us. We're welcoming you to this uh, little fireside chat we're having here today, um, just about omnichannel marketing strategy. I'm joined by uh, two very, very knowledgeable gentlemen, uh, both Sachin and Francisco. Um, and myself have been in the e-commerce space for a number of years, but I, I don't want to take too much of their thunder. So we'll start with Sachin. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself uh, and just give a little bit of background on, on, on what big commerce can do. Perfect. Thanks, Gabe. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Sachin Mathawan. I'm the Senior Director of Technology Partnerships at Big Commerce. Very excited to be part of this conversation. I think you'll find the content very timely, um, as we'll address on hopefully things that all uh, attendees uh, in this webinar are thinking about, you know, trying to figure out. So um, thank you, um, Omnisend, for having us uh, participate. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sachin. And Francisco, why don't you go ahead and uh, give yourself a little bit of an introduction, please. Thanks, okay. Gabe. Uh, so yeah, my name is Francisco Ambries. I am the marketing manager at BB Wheels. If you aren't too familiar with BB Wheels, uh, we basically sell aftermarket wheels, rims, and accessories. And I've been working with the company almost a year now. So otherwise than that, I'm happy to be here and excited to see you know, what we discuss and what we'll learn. Awesome. Thank you so much, Francisco and Sachin. And my name is Gabe Macaluso. I'm the Director of Customer Success here at Omnisend. I've been in the email space for about eight years now uh, and have worked with a number of Internet Retailer 1000 brands. So again, this can be a very interactive conversation. We're going to be chatting a lot and we're, we're glad you guys have tuned in to listen to us three talking heads, hopefully share some knowledge with you guys. <laughs> so here we go. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, so the, the agenda is pretty straightforward today. Um, I'm going to kind of start, go through some of the functionality that BB Wheels is leveraging in OmniSend and, and focusing on the omni-channel experience, um, share some stats with you guys about the uh, ability to integrate multiple channels and communicate with customers uh, where they're at and when they're at and, and how they like. Uh, and then I'll hand it over to Sachin to go through some of the information with BigCommerce uh, and just how the consumer behavior is changing in this 2020. Um, you know, at the beginning of the year, we were dealing with Australia having massive, devastating fires, and now it almost seems like an afterthought six months later, but uh, here we are. So definitely some changes that are impacting us around the world, and of course, we'll make time for the Q&A at the end. Um, so yeah, so today we want to talk about omni-channel marketing automation, and this can obviously mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, you know, I'll speak specifically about OmniSend. Um, you know, we offer a... a stack of technologies and marketing. So you've got email, SMS, web push notifications, as well as Facebook messengers. But the big thing is about changing that experience for the, for the customers they are shopping through your site and being very mindful of it. And BB Wheels does a fantastic job about that with this. So we can jump right into some of the stats. So, you know, here are some things that I found very interesting. So 17% higher click through rate when there's custom automation workflows, which most of us, if not everyone should have implemented. I still think the uh, you know, attach rate of a welcome series and abandoned cart on e-commerce sites is still in the neighborhood of 50 to 60%, which is just mind boggling. Um, when I'll show you some of the revenue numbers that BB Wheels is experiencing just in terms of ROI. Uh, and they're about four months into their contract with us. So um, it's one of those things, if you don't have a welcome and abandoned cart automation going, even just a simple thanks for signing up email, uh, you are missing out on massive amounts of revenue. Uh, we see a 90% higher customer retention rate um, by using multiple channels. So again, getting people bought into the to communication with your brand. So if you can get them to buy, buy into email as well as SMS, you've already got an engaged user. And we know that the, the cost of retaining a customer is way less than you know, the acquisition of a new customer. Um, yet time and time again, we see marketers just spend thousands upon thousands of dollars in, in social media ads, Facebook, advertisements and acquisition costs. Um, and it always kills me when I see people get excited about a 1.2 to a one ROI on Facebook ads. But I know that's successful and that's making you more money than you're spending. But when we try to aim for a 40 to one ROI in email, uh, it's sometimes mind boggling. And then, you know, we've got that 287% highest higher purchase rate from campaigns with three or more channels and automation workflows, uh, which we'll see an example from BB Wheels here as we go through this process. Um, so yeah, let's talk about supercharging your marketing strategy and, uh, and talk a little bit about what Francisco does. Um, so Francisco, I love your pop-up. Um, I, I think you guys have done such a good job here in sort of educating the customer about your brand, also creating the sense of urgency, uh, timely with the 4th of July in America and the countdown timer. 
Um, but yeah, just walk me through a little bit about sort of the the emotion you you kind of leaned on here um, in designing this pop up and getting people to sign up for your email channel. Yeah, with the pop up, ideally, um, first and foremost, we want to kind of educate and give key benefits versus like our competitors. So, for instance, we offer fast free shipping on basically all products anywhere in the United States and the lower forty eight states. Uh, and we do financing, you know, um, especially during these times in COVID where not everybody might have the funds available currently. So with the financing options, they're able to buy the wheels, tires, rims, whatever they need. And, you know, not have to worry about giving such a large payment, especially with such large ticket items. Uh, otherwise than that, I mean, we are proud, proudly family owned and operated. And I think that's a kind of a key current, current in these times just because everybody wants to support smaller businesses or local businesses. Otherwise than that, uh, you got the timer, which, you know, gives that sense of urgency, makes people want to like, buy now or check out what's going on. And we usually always have deals going on, you know, either daily or weekly or whenever. Um, and with people, they kind of want to get that discount. So, you know, we give them exclusive coupons or discounts when they sign up for emails with us. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And you can see the results from this, right? So um, I, I thought it was interesting. Like I know you guys offer a discount in that welcome message. You guys don't call it out here. Um, and it's always that fine balance of testing, whether or not a discount is necessary to convert mm -hmm. people. Um, and anytime I think as an e-commerce merchant, you can reduce the costs and, and reduce your, or increase your margins is a win. Um, but you can see some of the metrics here in terms of just your open rate is 42% on your welcome message versus 17% kind of overall open rate on your campaigns. This is looking at the last 30 days. Uh, your click rate is a 16.4% on that welcome message versus 2.9% on your click on your campaigns. And then your average order value is almost $200, $200 high, or more than $200 higher, which you know is, is huge, right? And I, now you guys are in a very special niche market in terms of your average order value. I'm sure there's a lot of e-commerce marketers uh, on the call today that would probably be willing to give you your, their right arm for uh, an <laughs> average order value of $700. So, um, but it, it's smart, right? And, and yep. you guys kind of hit all the, le the levels. Uh, and hey Gabe, if I, if, sorry, if I, if yeah. I make a comment on, I, I, I love the fact that the first thing that pops out from this pop-up is open for business, right? And I think that demonstrates the time that we're in. I don't think before COVID, people had to like tell consumers that we are open. But the fact that, right, we have to let consumers know that we are able to, you know, if you place an order, we are able to ship those orders to you. Like that's, you know, we can't take that for granted anymore. So um, I love that you're letting your consumers know that, you know, please shop with us because we're, we're ready for you. I agree 100%. We did get one, key, one question. It's, it's, if this is on your site. Uh, and yeah, it's live now. I, I literally pulled this screenshot from about at about 9 a.m. this morning. So um, that's perfect. And Francisco, do you by chance know the submission rate of this in terms of how many times it's viewed versus submission rate? Um, I'm not exactly sure on the number. Okay. It is pretty high, uh, but usually it depends. We have been running this kind of campaign, uh, or at least this pop-up for a good long time before we finally got integrated with Omnisend and was like, hey, we should add an email collection to it. So the numbers are kind of skewed in the sense of like, it's been viewed so much that when we finally did the change to add the email um, on it, it populating, but overall, when we did add this email sign up to it, I think we were getting about 200 more um, email collected per day. So it really made a huge difference. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and that's perfect. Yeah. And I love that you guys have it displayed right when you hit the site. Um, you know, sometimes pop-ins, pop-ups can be obnoxious and not everyone loves them. Um, especially your executive boards and your CEOs are like, oh, pop-ups are so annoying. I always tell people they should at least aim for a three to 5% submission rate. So when you start, you know, calculating that times your unique traffic on your site, uh, you can very easily grow your email list and people who are willing to give you their email. Um, and I'll show you later too, that you can also grab that SMS opt-in as well. People are, people are going, hey, I'm interested, I wanna buy, and this is the first impression that you can give. Uh, yeah, and, and it's an experience. The, sorry to interrupt. No, uh, please, go ahead. The cool thing about uh, getting the email right away when people hit the site is that it helps you with other automations that you have throughout the website, and you know, we'll touch up on them as we go, but uh, the other, other cool thing about this pop-up is it's so easy to interchange. Uh, so each is sectioned off. So, you know, maybe one week we want to go ahead and change, you know, that fast free shipping to something else uh, or other benefits that we have, such as like free tire road hazard protection. So I think it's just giving 
the consumer that hits your site right away, those benefits right away that keeps them coming back. Awesome, awesome, perfect. Um, so let's keep going on then. And, and just talking about the personalizing the welcome. So, um, you know, you can get obviously as customized as you want in this, depending on how much information you're collecting in that pop up. Um, but I think again, Francisco, you do a fantastic job in terms of just like, uh, you just want to thank them for signing up. You know, if we, if we recreate the experience online that you would expect in store, when you walk into a store, you know, Walmart has greeters, right? Why? Because there's all sorts of studies in terms of that. If there's a person at the front of the store saying, hi, welcome to Walmart, it, it generates more revenue. And that we can do the same thing as e-commerce brands through the email channel or through an SMS. So you guys have that. Um, now I noticed Francisco in your automation, you guys just have a one part series. We'll talk about one of your other automations later on that, that really utilizes the omni-channel experience. And we presented all the stats that we know that a multi-part automation will generate more revenue for you. So um, would love for you to just kind of talk about um, you know, what do you see in terms of next steps adding to this welcome series to kind of engage people uh, even further to get more people to purchase and increase that, that order value? Yeah, definitely. So as of right now, we just have this uh, right away when you sign up. Eventually, I want to be able to incorporate uh, more information on like the financing options or the free tire or even promotions. Uh, but as of right now, since we've only been with Omnicent about four or three months, I've been kind of more testing out of other automations. Uh, lastly, because I don't really want to go ahead and hammer people too much. Ideally, after this welcome, I'm looking at maybe like a couple, maybe like a few days, I'd hit them with like another automation uh, with like the financing information, just because you don't over want to overwhelm the consumer either. Sure. Yeah. Very, very smart. And again, super clean design on this email. Um, I always tell people, make sure that button's above the fold, which you guys have. Uh, and I always use the analogy of people like to mash the big red button and you've got it. So that's, it. and you know, you'll see those click rates go up. Uh, and those are great things to be testing as well in your, in your automations and your message creative is where is the button? What is the call to action? What is the color of the call to action? Um, you know, Amazon has a gold color. Why? Because they know it's going to sell. Um, and that for them, when all the testing, that's the color that caused people to buy more. Uh, and so it's perfect to fit with the brand voice and everything. Um, and then, of course, you can add the SMS. So just some stats, again, from the SMS piece of it. Um, this is a great kind of option. And there's actually a, a, a new site that was shared to me by one of my colleagues, uh, by the same folks that do really good emails. Uh, they have really good SMS now. Uh, and it's a whole collection of, of creative SMS because when we're communicating via SMS, um, you know, the goal is to be a more intimate experience with your, with your consumers, right? So email, you want to personalize it. You want to make it relevant. Um, SMS is that next level, right? So people love their phones. Sometimes it's, you know, one of their most prized possessions and people feel lost without it. So it's extremely important to make sure that if they allow us into that, that communication channel, we're very smart about it. Uh, we use it well and uh, we communicate in a positive way. So, um, but just interesting things, 14.2% average SMS click-through rate uh, and a 27 to one SMS ROI. So uh, SMS used to be kind of more cost prohibitive. It's coming down, we're seeing more and more adoption of it. So of course, the more SMS we send, the, the less it's gonna be. Um, but in no way do I think it will ever replace email as a primary revenue driver. Um, it's, it's gotta be that specific, specific channel. And so Francisco, when you guys think about SMS from, from a, brand standpoint at BB Wheels. Um, you know, I know BB Wheels has been around for a while and, you know, car guys are, are one of two different people, right? You've got the old guys and yeah. you've got the new guys. Um, and maybe the old guys are a little bit apprehensive about the SMS channel. So how do you go and, uh, and approach that with maybe some of your coworkers to go, hey, we, we've got to incorporate SMS? Yeah. So I, right now, currently, we don't have a huge SMS collection set up on the website. Um, that's something we're working toward just because, I, like I said, I think there's a lot of benefits. And like you said, you know, it's something that is in the future, you know, it's going to keep growing and, and get better. Uh, so usually what we do on the welcome one, you know, you might just get a heads up like, hey, you know, you're, thank you for signing up. Just a thank you. Just re, basically reinforcing that thank you and just saying, hey, we're here if you need us. Not really pushing them to buy just because, you know, some people might shy away. Like you said, the older guys might just be like, what the heck, how did they get my phone number? You know, this is so weird. Um, versus the younger guy might be like, oh, that's sweet. They sent me a text. Uh, so it's just kind of one of those things where you kind of have to play it delicately, um, especially in our industry, just because, you know, you have your older guys and your younger guys. So uh, just finding that those touch points that really hit home. Okay. 
Awesome. And Sachin, maybe you can chime in here a little bit too. What, what have you seen from, obviously Big Commerce represents a, a wide variety of different verticals um, and, and different brand types. Um, what do you see in terms of how the brands on Big Commerce are leveraging SMS to engage their audience? Yeah, I think, you know, for everything, everything that you mentioned, in addition to uh, just use of mobile in general, right? I think, you know, I, I believe it was about 18 months ago when we did an analysis across all our customers. So we have 60,000 merchants on our platform. And we saw this shift that the total number of orders that, that go through our platform um, were higher on mobile than on the web, right? And I think that doesn't surprise many businesses that, you know, people are out and about and they are more and more used to just using their, their phone to engage with the brand. And I think SMS plays in that bi-directional communication, right? They want to place orders, but they also expect that you'll reach them on their phone, right? So I think we're definitely seeing a, a growth in more adoption uh, on SMS. Awesome. And Francisca, this is actually probably a good question for you as well. And, and I'm putting you on the spot here. This wasn't in the questions I prepped you with, so I apologize. Um, but obviously, like BB Wheels, we saw the average order value. You know, this is... For me, this would be a, a purchase decision I'd really have to kind of think on and research, and really make sure this is the decision I want. Have you guys seen a similar shift in terms of the number of people purchasing on your mobile site versus desktop? Or where do you guys see that, that variant happening? Yeah, so our mobile has gone up uh, due you know, to COVID. Um, and we also did relaunch our website. We got a whole new design. So that's helped out with this, uh, you know, with, the COVID, with COVID going on. Uh, but we have seen a large number of like increase in mobile. And a lot of the times with like SMS, you know, like you said, it's, it's one of those larger ticket items where you kind of have to bounce around and just see if, you know, you really want to buy from this particular place or if you can find a cheaper deal. You know, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, but with the SMS, it's really helped us with just keeping us top minded for the consumer. And I think currently we're at uh, we used to be at a 10 percent return on customers. And now we're at like a 14 percent uh, with return out of uh, out of 100 versus being 80% new and 80, now we're like, I wanna say like, yeah, we're 80% new and then that 16% uh, okay. return, which SMS is really helping us with just that, just keeping customers coming back. And that's kind of ideally what we want is happy customers and them to keep coming back to us. That's, that's awesome. And um, what do you guys look at and just in terms of your timeline of a return customer? Is that like a 12 month window or, or how, what's that customer profile look like? Uh, usually it really comes down to, I would say it's within a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, you know, uh, usually when somebody wants to buy rims and tires or like any kind of automotive part that might be expensive, they've already had it in the back of the mind for a while. So then once they start shopping and start looking, they usually kind of, that kind of makes them want it even more. You know, if you add the pictures and you add the video and the emotion, uh, they'll shop around, you know, they'll come to the site, shop around, then they'll go to other sites, see what kind of offer or deals they give them. And ultimately then, you know, they come back. So I would say it's probably three to five different times they visit the, uh, the store before they make a final purchase. Okay, awesome, fantastic. Um, yeah, and again, this is just kind of reiterating that we've talked about. So um, why add a SMS? Um, if you're like me, I'm one of those people that does not like to have that little red bubble on my iPhone. So I read everything, uh, even if I don't want to read it and I just end up deleting it, both my inbox and my uh, messages. They're not at zero, but they're at zero on red because I can't stand the notification. Um, but 47% uh, of omnichannel campaigns are going to end with an SMS are going to end in conversion just overall, which is pretty spectacular. Uh, and then, of course, when we look at Gen Z and millennials, um, you know, as sad as this is, but a third of the Gen Z are psychologically uncomfortable away from being, uh, being away from their phone for 30 minutes, um, which is, is both well, great for us as e-commerce marketers and that we, we constantly have an avenue to, to reach them, but also kind of depressing as a society. So, um, yeah, I'm not Gen Z, but I'm, but I'm in that camp. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I 100% get it. And then I, I think this last stat, you know, um, even our CEO, Redis, did the podcast of like, you know, the email, email is dead or the, the you know, email is dead. Is that true or not? Um, but people see email is still a very viable solution and it's going to continue to grow. Um, I remember a couple years ago when Google released all of their tabs, right? And everyone thought, oh, this is the end. We're all going to see like massive unsubscribe rates. If anything, we saw open and engagements go up because now rather than people clearing out their inbox to just get to the meat of it, they're going, let me leave that stuff in my promotions tab. 
And when I go on my lunch break or, or when I'm, you know, go to the bathroom or, you know, when I sit in traffic, um, I can go ahead and, you know, click through that promotions tab and start shopping. So uh, very interesting stuff there. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. Okay. And then of course, um, this is just a pop-up from Omnisend. It's, you know, example where you can capture email and phone number. Again, the biggest thing here is going to be able to test it. Um, I always go back and forth in terms of, you know, hit him with it right away, but the more fields you have, that's a bigger hurdle, right? We spend so much time optimizing checkout and reducing clicks and reducing steps to make sure we get that conversion and capturing someone's email address is exactly that. It's the front end conversion. So if we're adding a whole bunch of additional fields, what may be beneficial on the, in the back end in terms of segmentation and being able to have multiple channels, um, how can we be strategic in making sure that we're getting as many people filling this up as, uh, as possible? Uh, and then again, just purchase rate. I think, you know, seeing that 3x difference between three or more channels or single channel marketers, um, you know, if you can hit people through email, um, through SMS, they're going to be more aware of your brand. Um, I tell people when I work with them, at a minimum, they should be communicating with their broadcast audience at least twice a month. Um, it can seem overwhelming as if you're a smaller merchant and, you know, you're a team of one or a team of two um, to to figure out enough content to generate in all of these messages. Um, but I always tell people like, make it simple. Like one email a month is your new releases and the other email a month is, you know, whatever you have a ton of stock of and you're just trying to liquidate. Um, and that can be your big sale email. And that's, that's how you can start really simple in terms of just a content calendar. Uh, and, and you don't have to make it more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, one of my favorite sites is milled.com. That's like mill, like a corn mill with the ED. Um, and what it does, it basically just aggregates a whole bunch of different brand emails out there. Uh, and the great thing about it is when you go to that site and you start looking at all these like major brands that probably have, you know, 40 people on their email team, it's usually one giant graphic image with a giant 20% off and a giant click here. And no personalization, no, no, nothing strategic about it. It's literally just push the sale. So, um, you know, we love to get into the nitty gritty of it, but we don't need to overcomplicate things. We just need to make sure we're communicating people at the right time. Okay. Um, and then converting abandoners. So, um, you know, when people give us data, this is what they expect us to do in personalizing marketing emails. Um, you know, Starbucks probably does the best job of this, right? We all sign up for the free birthday coffee and they keep track of what we're ordering. Uh, but it's also funny how much information we get to give to these brands. They, they notice our purchase behavior, they notice our gender, and yet we don't do anything with it. Um, so people are kind of going, hey, if I'm gonna give you my gender, do something with it. Um, if I'm gonna give you my birthday, you better believe I want a birthday coupon, right? Like, you know, and there's some creative ways to do it. So I worked with a running shoe company in the past and for anyone they didn't have the birthday, they would just send a happy unbirthday email um, in, in hopes of collecting that. So there's a lot of flexibility you can do there. Um, but if you're gonna get this information, make sure you're utilizing it. And if you don't have the resources to utilize all that personal information, don't spend your time asking for it. Wait until you have the time to develop those things and then, and then build from there. Um, so I think that's extremely important. Um, all right, so let's get into the, the, the actual numbers of the abandoned cart automation. And, and Francisco, I think you guys do a fantastic job of really sort of um, integrating both email and SMS into it. Um, and what I think is a, a crazy statistic when I was looking at your numbers, um, you have two thirds of the year to go and year to date, you guys are um, experiencing 159 to one ROI and that's on your total spend with Omnisend. Mm -hmm. So this one automation, is is paying for your Omnisend bill 159 times over um, with with much of the year to go left. So that's a good story, right? <laughs> um, so so just walk me through the strategy of your abandoned cart flow and and tell me how you mix together email and SMS. Yeah, definitely. So um, like I, I had referred earlier, uh, the biggest thing is you know getting that email right away when people come to the website because then you can use it throughout um, your website for different automations. So for instance, it works really nice when we get that email right away and people are shopping just because we know the consumer is gonna to come to the website, shop around, you know, spend a little bit of time here and then jump somewhere else. Uh, in that meantime, they might add an item to their cart and it's something that they really wanna get, but they still wanna make sure, you know, that they have the funds or, you know, something, they got the best deal basically. Uh, so when we get that email, we go ahead and, you know, right away they get entered when they leave that item in the cart and they go somewhere else, they get entered into this automation. 
with this abandoned cart. And usually, you know, you'll get like an email. First email you'll get, we send out, it's just a coupon saying, hey, you know, come back. You know, you're, we, we're giving you this coupon to come and spend it, uh, to use it. And then you get hit with an SMS a uh, couple of, I think it's a few days later, you have seven days later, just because, like I said, we don't want to uh, be overburdensome on the consumer just because, you know, we never know what's going through or what they're thinking. Um, and this just reminds them that they still have that coupon and that they can come back at any time and use it uh, or that we've extended it basically. And it, it's been working really well just in the sense of some people like to have a coupon in the back of their pocket just because you never know when they're going to come back and shop. So it's been working really well. And on top of that, we go ahead and shoot them with that, uh, not shoot them, but we give them that, uh, um, that financing option. So just in case, like I said, during these times of financing, you know, they might not have the money available, but this way they can go ahead and get the wheels of their dreams or the tires that they need or accessories to customize their vehicle now that they have, you know, usually more free time than before. That's awesome. And what kind of feedback are you guys getting in terms of like your customer service team or customer support team with, with your contacts calling in? Like, are they, are they mentioning SMS or are you getting any feedback directly from your consumers about, about the, the multiple channels? Uh, not necessarily, but I have seen a spike in, you know, people using the coupon uh, versus I think before we had the coupon available uh, through different channels, but nobody really ever used it because there was not like, it wasn't an incentive enough for them to really use it versus now we see a lot more people using this coupon or they'll use the later the coupon that comes available after, you know, two weeks. So yeah. it's, it's working really well. Good, good. Awesome. Awesome. And this is a little bit of a tangential conversation, but I think it's one that's interesting. And I think it's one that we hear a lot from marketers. Um, obviously you guys are using a static code. There's, there's the camps that say static code is better. A unique coupon code is better. Sort of walk me through your decision to use a, a static code. Um, we just figured it'd be, usually a lot of people know that when you get a coupon or a consumer, most consumers know that a coupon usually kind of can be generic or it's going to give you the same value at the end of the day. Uh, so we just decided to use the static coupon just because it's easy to remember. And on top of that, you still keep it there. You don't have to worry about going back in and then trying to remember what it was that that personalized. Either way, I think at the end of the day, um, coupons will add value to whatever you're trying to do. So it's been working really well with us and I haven't had really any issues with it, like I said. Good, yeah, awesome. And that's sort of always my mindset of it. It's like, if I have the margin to give and this mm -hmm. coupon generates, you know, 10 more orders over the course of a week that I mm -hmm. wouldn't have gotten because they found it on Honey or whatever websites, you know, Retail Me Not, I'd rather take the 10 conversions than not have those 10 conversions because someone didn't track down a coupon code. Exactly. Um, so. That, that to me makes sense. Obviously, there's, there's a, a, a case for it and you can set up multiple automations to make sure that, you know, not everyone goes through the, the coupon code automation and mm -hmm. you, know, you can play around with that testing and that kind of stuff to see that conversion. So that's actually, awesome. I actually love the creativeness of the coupon code, Francisco, you came up with, which is you're kind of enforcing emotionally for them to buy the wheels today, right? So it's, it's creating an urgency on make this purchase, right? You know, have, have your dream come true. So I think it, in addition to just something that's easy to remember, I think it's probably creating, you know, an emotional attachment to, I should be making this purchase today. So it's, that's great, it's very creative. Thank you. Perfect. Um, and then before I hand it over to Sachin, just one last question for you, Francisco, and I'll just kind of leave it on this slide. Um, you know, you have several automations set up in your account. We obviously highlighted the welcome and abandoned cart here. Um, as you guys think through and your strategy and, and you start, you know, continuing to develop what you guys are working on at, at BB Wheels, where do you see the next automation sort of being your primary focus? Um, we're thinking of adding a rewards system with our website. Um, I think that is where we're going to go ahead and add an automation just to remind people, hey, you have so many points, you know, go ahead and spend them, save this much money. Otherwise, another one that I was thinking uh, of adding or basically just more of a benefits automation uh, reminder. Like I had said earlier, you know, maybe a couple of days or a week after they purchase something, they might get reminded that they have the free tire warranty. Or, you know, even if they didn't make the purchase and they still have the item in the cart, they could be reminded again of the financing options that we have. It just reminded the consumer that, you know, these options are available to them and they can go ahead and use them whenever they want. It's just one of those automations I think would really add value to what we're doing. Yeah, awesome. And the best part is once you set them up, you don't have to do anything with them. They just exactly. make money. They're awesome. <laughs> awesome. 
All right, awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, well, Sachin, I'll hand it over to you, um, and you can do the classic next slides. You just let me know, and, and we'll and we'll roll through these. <laughs> That's perfect. No, this is really great to learn from uh, Francisco your your experience leveraging both BigCommerce and Omnisend to to be able to implement these technologies. Obviously, we always believe that technology should enable your strategy, right? So you should not be a marketer and have a creative idea, but then you're like, well, I can't really implement that idea because I don't have the right technology. So, so I would love for the, for the audience to kind of take a step back and you know, from an e-commerce platform perspective, before we go into big commerce, uh, Gabe, if you go to the next slide, yep. I really want us to kind of take on this journey that, that takes a step, you know, step back and looks at what's going on in the industry, right? In the e-commerce industry. And this is the greatest push that we are seeing towards e-commerce. I think all of us can think about friends, family members in, within our networks that never shopped online, right? They were just hesitant to buy groceries online or you know, use Uber Eats or place food, you know, food order or even shop online in general that technically have been for the last couple of months now forced to e-commerce, right? So, and, and hopefully they are learning the benefits of the flexibility and the convenience of being able to place orders online and, and you know, engage with the brand directly, right? So, so we're certainly seeing that, that change um, in, in kind of forging new habits for the future, right? And, and this change is something that is gonna be business critical for, for merchants to apply towards their acquisition as well as their retention strategies with their customers. So if you go to the next slide, um, continuing with this theme, kind of what happened, uh, what started as a local problem uh, very quickly grew global, right? So of course, I'm talking about COVID here, you know, started with rapid slowdown in, in manufacturing and distribution channels were, were kind of, um, you know, disrupted. Um, and then you guys remember, right? We saw this surge of everybody buying hand sanitizers and toilet paper and bicycles. And, and I think there were many businesses that kind of fell that did offer those essential items, couldn't survive the surge, right? Because they didn't have the right tools and strategy right resources available. Others, which I believe Francisco BB Wheels kind of falls you know, in that category where you, you had the, the scale to be able to handle that surge and accommodate right, the need of your consumers. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and what followed from that was really this change in shopping behavior. And, and I think we're continuing to experience how this change is happening because you know, states are opening up and shutting down and um, you know, so, so would people, when, whenever this is over, would people go back to browsing in store and, and, uh, and buying in store? Or I believe this, this shopping behavior has changed for the permanent, right? So if you go to the next slide. So at, as big commerce, we have, like I mentioned, 60,000 customers, merchants on our platform, uh, small businesses, mid-market enterprises. And we've been observing uh, and distributing, sharing this knowledge of the trends that we are seeing, right? And we have identified top nine categories within our customer base um, and how they've kind of fared during, during you know, year over year performance during COVID. I don't think many of these categories will surprise you all. You know, one that always surprised me was the vehicles and parts. And obviously when I talked to Francisco, it's like from, my, from one side, I was like, well, not many people are driving with the shutdown, so why is this category showing up? But you know, it's because people are home and they wanna work on their cars. And uh, um, you know, so that, that explained a lot to me on the vehicles and parts, but, but it is really different trends, different merchants, depending on which vertical you're on, um, you're kind of experiencing the changes in consumer behavior differently. So if you go to the next slide, Gabe, please. Yeah, absolutely. So, what that leads us to is that it's time to shape the next normal. Now, I don't think anybody on this call can predict, predict when that next normal is, right? But I think we all can agree that a new normal is coming, right? A new normal where level of personalization that our consumers will expect is gonna be higher, right? So, you know, just thinking about, right now we think about personalization in terms of <clears throat> what somebody's past buying behavior is or you know what color of product they like but think about additional attributes of personalization right so things like on the checkout 
I think by default, we expect that if you're buying online, you're going to get this stuff delivered, right? But now on the checkout, you got Bopis, buy online, pick up in store. You got curbside, right? You got all these level of attributes that are going to be specific to that, to that consumer. Excuse me. So that leads us to hyper-personalization, right? So this is a concept. It's not, we're not all not used to personalization. I think we've been thinking about personalization for a while, but we really have to think about hyper-personalization, especially for the consumers that are net new to our businesses, right? So I, I don't know, Francisco, if you've experienced a trend in kind of, I know you mentioned 80% new, 20% repeat, mm -hmm. but do you have any data or any trends on just people that you're observing that might have never shopped online if it wasn't for COVID? Yeah, so one of the things I did notice that was kind of interesting was uh, tablet uh, numbers going up. So the user of tablet users. Uh, generally, I like to think like tablet users usually tend to be either the uh, more older audience just because most of the time they don't like using the phone just because it's too small or using a computer and the tablet's easier. So I've seen a spike of, I think uh, prior to COVID, we were at maybe like a 5%. Um, and now we're at like a 15% users are on tablet. So that kind of indicates to me, like I said, it's an older audience that's kind of generally using the tablet just because it's easier to shop. And that currently means to me that, you know, we're getting older audiences that might have never really shopped online versus, you know, they're used to their, their tire shop ordering tires for them or going to a local store. And now they're kind of like, hey, you know, I can't really go out. Let me go ahead and order wheels and tires directly to me or to my shop and it just simplifies the process so much easier versus you know going there and you know not being able to get helped yeah yeah i think it'll be really interesting for businesses and merchants to think about as you're attracting these new shoppers online shoppers how do you what does their journey look like how can you as a business help them ease into because these are not the people that also shop on amazon all the time and also Uber Eats all the time, right? So just thinking from that hyper-personalization perspective. And then also applying that experience um, or applying that hyper-personalization throughout their experience, right? From every experience and every engagement, because we don't, sometimes we only think about personalization from, you know, which products we show them or recommend, but it really starts from acquisition, engagement, retention, you know, checkout, right? As we talked about, all the way to returns, right? Do they prefer to return via just mail or do they want to walk in and you know return in store so we're seeing that that use case as well next slide please okay. so we've talked about e-commerce industry as a whole let's uh, zoom in on big commerce as an e-commerce platform so for those of on the call that are not familiar with e-commerce uh, we have over 60,000 customers on our platform we've been around since 2009 um, we have 750 plus employees headquartered in Austin, Texas, and we serve merchants in over 120 plus countries. And then on the next slide, our mission is really to help merchants sell more at every stage of growth. What that means is regardless of which, are you just starting out as a business? Are you growing as a business? Are you doing 100 million online? We, we are the platform for you, right? In the sense that you can continue to grow and scale on our platform. So the three key value propositions that we offer to our merchants are total cost of ownership, um, powerful performance, and built for growth. So let me go into each of those uh, one by one. So excuse me, total cost of ownership, you know, in industry referred as TCO. Um, all that means is what is your cost of selling online? right? Being able to sell online or being able to sell more online, right? So some of the attributes that go into that are platform updates. Like how long does it take you to implement your online store or implement online strategy or start selling online or start selling more online, right? Um, on, the next step, on the next slide, in the um, built for growth, and I think these, some of these slides are reversed from, from the order, but built for growth really talks about I'm just starting out my business, so my e-commerce needs are very limited right now, right? I'm not doing a lot of the advanced, maybe I'm not using loyalty uh, programs right now, right? So how can I continue to use my same e-commerce platform and then add on solutions on top of that, which is a third-party app, or I may not have been doing email marketing, but now I'm ready to do advanced email marketing, start engaging with my customers 
how do I find OmniSend and then integrate OmniSend on top of my e-commerce platform, right? So you want to make sure that your e-commerce platform enables you to continue to grow on the platform as your business continues to grow and evolve. And then performance, uh, I don't know if anybody on this call is net new to selling online, but you know, uptime is the key, right? Uptime is really important because imagine if your physical store um, is you know, locked for an hour and consumers, sh shoppers can go in, not imagine, we've been experienced that with COVID, um, that's equivalent to uptime, right? So you don't wanna have your store not be available or not be able to process orders uh, at any time. So, and then in addition to performance of just being uptime, the other performance that's really important, which we talked about is shoppers experience regardless of how they're buying, right? So if I'm on desktop, if I'm on mobile, I as a consumer expect fast response, right? So I could be on a 3G, 4G network, I could be on a Wi-Fi, right? So really being able to deliver that experience regardless of um, the speed and, and what medium they are making that purchase on is really important. And the last slide is really around, um, oh, sorry, there was, there, was, there was one concept around B2B that I wanted to talk about, which is really around many businesses think about e-commerce as a retail, right, as B2C. Some of the trends we've been observing, which I, I'm, I'm guessing some of you can relate to, is even as B2C businesses, as you grow on our platform, right, you start at sometimes you start to act more like B2B, right, because you have bulk buyers and you have wholesalers that are purchasing from you, right? Those buyers expect a different experience, not dramatically different, but they expect slightly different experience in their shopping experience, in shopping uh, journey, right? So the platform, the e-commerce platform should be able to accommodate as your B2C business grows into B2B. And then we see the other reverse trend as well, where we see a lot of B2B businesses that have primarily sold through distribution channels are starting to act more like B2C because they are going direct to consumer, right? So even for those businesses, being able to create that B2C experience for your accessories or some parts that you're not selling through the distribution channel can be really interesting. So again, the e-commerce platform should accommodate whichever business model that you've implemented uh, to help, your, help you keep growing your business on the platform. Awesome, awesome. And Francisco, does BB Wheels do any wholesale or, or B2, call it B2B sell, uh, sale? I mean, we do a little bit uh, to like dealerships in a sense. Um, ideally, we want to try to grow that as well going forward. But right now, mostly we're B2C just because that's how we've been working for a while now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And do you have specific revenue goals, like percentage of revenue to try to move over? Which is very interesting because a lot of times, as Sacha mentioned, we kind of hear like, we're a B2B business and that's 80% is wholesale and 20% consumer. And we're trying to make it like 60, 40 and you guys are kind of doing the backwards path or the yeah. reverse path of that. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't necessarily have numbers, um, but I know down the road, eventually we'd like to get a bigger percentage of B2B um, just because it's more, you know, it's kind of more reoccurring versus a consumer might shop one time and then that's done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I do like, I, Sacha, I do like what you said. I, I think there's this sort of, almost bridge between like a true B2B where we're like, you know, Sachin, you and I are in software sales and there's contracts and negotiations and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then the direct to consumer, which is add it to my cart and purchase. And I, I like to coin this term, it's called like business to purchaser, because basically you're working with the one or two people in the purchasing department and you can really treat them like that D2C consumer where um, I worked with a company that sold metals online and it was, you know, eight foot, two inch steel rods. Uh, and one of their best performing automations at that company was their birthday automation. Um, because ultimately, like, I always kind of had this persona of like Brenda down in purchasing, right? It was all these like sort of mom and pop metalworking fabrication shops. Um, and so ultimately, it was like that one person that was getting the email from this brand. And if she had to order a new set of steel rods, she had a number of companies to order from. And if she got a birthday email that day from that specific company, that puts that brand at top of mind. And it's just another reason to touch base with them. And it's another reason to have, instead of having, you know, maybe like a full sales team that's calling on all these accounts, you can start automating it through email, which is those, those little touches in the, in the same way that a consumer would expect that personalization. So I think that's really, yeah. really smart. 
Yeah, I can almost see Francisco as you as you were talking about kind of you know growing into that, right? Like one of the common scenarios I see on how B two B buyer is different than B two C is they don't want to use their credit card to make the purchase, right? Because they might be buying ten wheels, right? Yeah. Um, and the the credit card rates can can vary. So being able to offer those consumers a slightly different checkout experience where they can place an order, but they are you know they're on terms and the payment actually happens outside of e-commerce, right? So it's just simple things like that that you can do, which will help you attract more of those wholesalers and buyers um, while still you know, offering them the same B2C experience. Exactly, no. Uh, one other thing I want to add too, for those that are kind of concerned about how hard it might be to integrate OmniSend with BigCommerce, it's super easy. Um, it literally is like a click of a button. Um, because we, before we joined OmniSend, we were with another email provider, and it was taking us the longest time to get set up. And once we brought Omni, uh, OmniSend on board, it was literally like a click of a button and then I was able to get to work right away. So I think that's like an awesome thing to have, especially if you're just a one man team or a one woman team, you can't really do it all and have all the time to try to figure everything out. So OmniSend and BigCommerce make that, makes that super easy. So that's one of the awesome things about them. Awesome. Thank you for that, Francisco. And I, I promise to all the people listening in, Francisco is getting no, no payback for this, no, no kickbacks whatsoever. That was completely unsolicited. So I just make sure that's very clear. So I really, really appreciate that testimony, Francisco. Um, so that, that's awesome. So we've got about 15 minutes. We'd love to take questions from the audience. I know we've, we've already answered a couple. Um, you can direct a question at any of us. So obviously, you know, I'm on the email side and you know, I've been in the industry a long time and have worked with anything from, you know, BB wheels to selling metals online to, you know, fashion brands that are, are a staple of your closet. Um, sachin has been in the industry forever and obviously works with a number of brands. And then, you know, Francisco is, is, is sitting in your seat. So uh, if there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. And uh, I used to be an eighth grade science teacher in another life. So I, I've got a lot of patience in the world. So we, <laughs> we can, we'll give people a couple minutes to kind of fill in, uh, fill in on that. But um I'm, I'm, also curious, I'm also curious while while the audience is thinking about questions, you know, yeah. I would love to learn, you know, since I talked about this new norm, right? And and you know, I'm very curious to see how businesses are thinking about like what happens once this COVID thing is over, right? How do we what are some strategies that you all are thinking about? What are some ways that you know your business will be different from before and after? And I don't know, Francisco, if you have thoughts that you, you know, your exec team internally have been kind of, you know, thinking through that because you were on the, on the good side of this equation where, you know, the, this, this, has, this has brought you a lot more customers, right, that, that mm -hmm. might, might not have been attracted to it. Um, so just curious from the audience or from Francisco on what, what does that new norm look like? Um, it, it's, you know, it's one of those things where we're not 100% sure what the norm, norm will, you know, look like. Uh, just we have, like I said, we've seen a huge increase in mobile and tablet. And I think that's going to keep going on for basically now forever. Uh, and on top of that, I think just people are going to be more used to ordering things versus before they were scared to order online. You know, what if I get hacked? What if, you know, they steal my information, this and that. But I think going forward, people are just going to get used to that. Uh, I mean, like, for instance, Amazon has been a game changer and everybody knows that. Uh, Back in the day, nobody really ordered anything online. It was even my own parents when I was younger, they were like, no, don't put the information in there. You know, they're going to take all my money. And now it's, it's, you know, it's as easy as going to a store and swiping. That's literally what you do nowadays. You just go in there, fill out that information. And on top of that, I think going forward, you know, saved information for like, for you to go back in there. The shopping experience is going to be so much easier and faster. And I think that's just going to become the new norm. And people are going to expect that when they go shopping is they already have my information. I just hit order and it's done. Um, so that's one of the things I think we're going to see a huge change in and it's just going to keep going. Awesome. Awesome. We did get a couple questions. Um, so Francisco, I've got a thought on this first question, but I'll let you answer first. Uh, Tony asked, how many emails are too many emails? That's a good question. I generally ask that question myself because <laughs> I tried to put myself in the consumer's shoes. Yeah. You know, do I want to get spammed with a ton of email? Uh, but usually what I do is I'll send out about, like you said earlier, you know, two emails a month, uh, just for sure. That, that should be the minimum. And you can space them out as much as you want, but usually I do one like every two weeks. And what I'll do is if there's something important that I think might be vital for the consumer, then I create another email and send it out. But usually one or two is my go-to number. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to kind of tie into this as well, like, you know, Tony, I think, and, you know, for emails is how many is too many. It's how many your audience is willing to accept from you and, and will engage with you. So, you know, making sure that you're segmenting your audience, making sure you're looking at people who last open, last click, last order date, I think are all, you know, key metrics you should be looking at. I mean, I've worked with people who send three emails every day to a database of, you know, a million plus, and you're like, oh my goodness, what, what are you doing? But they're getting 20 to 30% open rates, which is, is good. You know, we tell our, we tell our customers to try to at least aim for a 15% open rate. That's solid inbox placement. We can tolerate 10%. Anytime you start getting below 10%, you really need to take a step back and look at your audience and think about the content you're sending them and say, okay, do I need to clean up my list a little bit? Which I know kills people because the cost of acquisition for that email address is so high that you don't want to give it up. But I always kind of, uh, you know, compare it to the, the ex-girlfriend, right? If you call your ex-girlfriend 50 times in a row and she never answers, you need to stop calling her, right? Like you got to move on. It's time to, it's time to cut and run. So um, I, I think as, as many emails as, as they'll be willing to, to take from you is, is the good answer there. Mm -hmm. um, Tammy said, would you suggest to use a landing page to collect more emails? Um, and do we have any good integration recommendations? So we'll kind of start with the first part of the question there. Um, and Francisco, you may have some experience with this. Um, what do you feel is sort of the best way to capture an email address with someone coming to your site? Yeah, um, and that's one of the things I debated at first was whether just having a pop-up or a full-on landing page. Um, and ultimately, we ended up deciding just doing the pop-up because we feel like a landing page will take people away from your site. Um, and it kind of adds that extra step of having to you know, go back versus just typing it and it exits by itself. Um, so, I, I mean, personally, from the success that we've had with pop-ups, I think pop-up is the way to go. Then again, it really comes down to your audience and the type of store you have. You know, a landing, landing page might be better if maybe if you have a lot more information to give versus a pop-up is just sleek and fast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great question. And this will kind of answer Tammy's second half of her question. And, and we had a couple of anonymous attendees um, ask some questions, but, um, you know, in terms of entry and exit pop-ups onto a Shopify site or a big commerce site, how do you get those? There's gonna be a number of third-party apps. OmniSend's pop-up functionality uh, will let you do exit and entry intent, as well as give you a couple different forms. OmniSend also has a landing page integration uh, with, with Shopify and BigCommerce and OmniSend as well. Um, so there's you know a number of options out there. Uh, the most common ones that you see, if it's not within your email provider, are gonna be like a Justuno or a Privy, um, Sumo me. I mean, there's there's a thousand different pop-ups, and all of them have different functionalities. Some perform better than others. That kind of thing. Francisco, who do you guys use for your pop-up vendor? Um, we use a, a mixture. Uh, we use you guys on some pop-ups, and then we use uh, Privy on the other pop-up. So it's a mixture. It really comes down to uh, how they're set up, and you know, we try to optimize each for their use. Yep, that's perfect. That's perfect. Uh, and then should you send an SMS or email first? Francisco, what do you think about that? Oh, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> Generally, I have been sending emails first just because that's what people are used to. Um, going forward, SMS might just become a faster and easier way to communicate something of urgency. Uh, so for me personally, and like I said, the success that we've had, email has been working great. It kind of gives that warning to people like, hey, we've contacted you once. And then the text message SMS comes in after versus you know, they might be kind of weirded out right now just because SMS isn't the norm yet. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I think that's the strategy too. So um, I've seen a number of things where it'll say like, you know, they'll send an SMS where it's go check your inbox. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a directive. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it just matters on what you're communicating there. Um, and let's see, uh, is there a best practice for segment exit on your automations? Um, Francisco, I mean, obviously on abandoned cart, I know we've set it up where like if someone makes a purchase, they're kicked off. That makes mm -hmm. sense, right? We don't want to keep sending messages uh, if they've made the purchase. Um, but what other kind of like, uh, we'll call them automation cancellations, do you guys kind of consider, or do you exclude people from entering a workflow? Um, it really comes down to whether they've been on that workflow before. Uh, so like, you know, maybe they have already bought an item and, or well, not necessarily. I mean, every time they come in and add an item to their uh, cart, they get entered into that automation. And usually what happens is either they make the purchase or they don't, and then they just automatically get exited out. Once it hits that final notification of, hey, you, you, know, you got this email uh, with this discount, go ahead and use it. And if they don't, it just automatically takes them out. Because um, like you said, we don't necessarily want to keep hammering people with the same emails. Uh, so we just kind of let them live their process. And if they come back again to the website and they add 
another item or they do something to you know re-enter that segmentation that automation i mean then they'll be back in that process but usually we just let them live there that's what's been working really well with us anyways awesome awesome Perfect. And then um, we've got a couple more questions, but I know we're coming up on time. So um, we'll, we'll try to answer these rapid fire. So um, Alicia asks, is there a way to prevent emails from landing in the spam and junk mail? Um, and, you know, Francisco can attest to this. They have great open rates. The biggest thing is just making sure that you're engaging with your audience. That's the biggest thing. Gmail and Hotmail inboxes will look at, are people opening and clicking your messages? And if they're not, they're going to put you in the spam folder. Uh, real quick story, I worked with a guy who sold uh, airline parts or airplane parts, like uh, hobby, hobby, private pilot. Uh, and he would sign up for all his competitors. And this was like his way of sabotaging them. Uh, would, he'd like mark every email as spam. Well, Gmail started reading that this guy, even though he owned the airplane part company, doesn't want to receive emails about airplane parts. So they started, Gmail also started putting his own company emails into the spam folder. Um, and so Gmail's, you know, if, if you can figure out how Gmail puts stuff in the inbox, the primary versus the, the promotion folder, you will make a bajillion dollars because you will crack the secret sauce. And as soon as you figure it out, they're going to change it anyway. Um, but yeah, so the biggest thing is just engagement and making sure you're sending the, the audience that wants to receive your messages. So that means good opt-in practices, segmenting out people who aren't opening your messages, not ordering from you, all those kind of things. Um, and then, uh, Nicholas asked, collect phone number and email all at once or send an email later for more information. You, you got to test, right? So the big thing there is if, if you start collecting phone number and email at the front end and you notice that, you know, submission rate of your pop-up goes from 7% to 2%, I would say that's not a good plan. And, and the better, the better out is to go and ask for that email for later information. Obviously, in the in the big commerce settings in, in your checkout, Sachin, I think you can set it up where you can actually collect that SMS opt-in at checkout, just like an email. And that's a great place to kind of capture those people. You've got, obviously, high intent and engaged people. They're completing that purchase with you, and so they're going to get that SMS opt-in. So um, any of the other questions, we'll answer offline. I know there, there was a couple more that came in, um, but want to make sure we wrap up on time in case people have to jump for 4 o'clock phone calls. Um, so Sachin, I'll give you the floor if you have any parting words real fast. No, thank you. Thank you for listening. I, I, you know, I'll go back to there's a lot of unknown. Um, right now in terms of what the new normal is going to look like, how the consumer behavior is changing. Um, and, I, and I think it's, uh, you know, I can speak from a platform standpoint that we want to make sure that our customers have the tools and, and capabilities to ensure that whatever that change is coming, they can, they can adopt to that change. And the, the technology should enable you and, and should enable your strategy and not the other way around. So... Uh, thank you for participating in this in this webinar and listening. Awesome. Francisco, any parting words from BB Wheels team? Um, no, well, I mean, thank you guys for having me. You know, I'm happy that I was able to share experience and knowledge on this subject. And, you know, if you guys ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or to the OmniSend or Big Commerce team. They're more than happy to help. Awesome. Thank you so much, Francisco. Yes. Thank you so much, Francisco, Sachin. And on behalf of BB Wheels, Big Commerce, and OmniSend, we so appreciate your attendance today. Uh, we hopefully gave you guys some good insight into this world that we're currently living in uh, and wish you guys all the best in implementing successful omni-channel strategies. Uh, and thank you guys so much and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Bye, everybody.